um, that that we aren't, they're not approvable, and DEQ doesn't dispute that. We haven't approved them. We are in the process of reviewing those plans. And I have staff in my shop who have probably spent the better part of a year and a half working with both pipeline companies, first to get annual standards and specs sufficiently approved to a point where we can approve them, and now what we're doing is we are comparing every plan sheet with what's in those approved annual standards and specs and making sure that underlying land use, soil, um, 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 calculations, runoff, all of that is straight. And those plans will not be approved until a certified plan reviewer at DEQ has said yes, they meet the annual standards and specifications which meet the requirements of the regulation. And again, we have never done this for a pipeline before. We have never just rolled up our sleeves and dug into the details of what the ENS plans and the post-construction stormwater plans require. We also, although not required by law or regulation, we require ACP to post their erosion and sediment control plans and their stormwater management plans for at least 30 days for public review on technical and engineering issues. Again, we heard um, a number of concerns that property owners, local governments, um, folks who are more out in the field might have good information that would reflect on the adequacy of ENS and stormwater plans. So we said, great, we would like that input and we posted those plans. We set up a dedicated mailbox to receive comments, and in fact, we've only received a limited number of technical comments on those plan sheets. And as I said, we're still reviewing those plans, and land disturbance can't occur until DEQ approves the plans. Um, I'm a little confused as to why you heard so many comments about we're not look, letting anybody look at these plans. Um, we posted it on our website. We had the link to ACP's plans. I think we even set out an RSS feed, and I'm not exactly sure what that is, um, that said the plans are out there. I mean, we have actively encouraged folks to take a look at the plans. So I don't know where the comment comes that um, there's been no comment or review on those plans. Um, the other thing I wanted to address, and this is really, really um, project specific in terms of what the engineers and the ENS experts find when they're in the field. Because there is, in fact, um, an iterative process when it comes to figuring out what is appropriate and adequate ENS controls. So we got the approved standards and specs. We will have approved plans before land disturbing activity occurs. But sometimes you have conditions in the field um, where you have to take another look or tweak something or increase the size of something. So for construction and sleep, steep slope areas generally, um, the way you address erosion and sediment control is you employ a number of ENS practices in series. And the steepness of the slope is really key to determining how many measures might be needed. Um, one of the typical um, tools that is used in sleep, steep construction activity are what are called water bars. Um, and those are, you know, sort of humps along the right of way that divert water into um, the forested areas on the side. They, um, they dissipate the flow. They turn it into something um, more than just the, the kind of scenarios that, that were described yesterday, which is just this massive flow of water coming down the base of the mountain. Um, another critical component are what are called clean water diversions which is you actually manage precipitation and keep it off the construction site so it doesn't have an opportunity to come into the disturbed land and, and pick up that sedimentation. Um, I have included, um, oh, next please. I also wanted to mention that we have very specific requirements 
and have really thought about the engineering practices that you need to make sure that in an open trench area, that that, that trench um, is, is designed and is um, operated from an erosion set of control point of view, that it's not going to act as a conduit. Um, and again, um, I've got an engineer who has been working on all this stuff, of, 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 and, and I can talk to some of the the higher level concepts. Um, but basically, we will require um, trench breakers in an open trench. A lot of times, depending on the slope, we'll pair those with what are called slope drains, which is actually a system to get the water out of the trench and again to diffuse it um, off the right of way. Um, and that is um, where we are with the ENS plans. I've included a number of typical ENS control measures um, that are utilized in utility construction. I don't think we need to go through them, but I put them out there, up there just in case um, you had some quite specific questions about that. Question. Mr. Chairman, uh, Melanie, there was a, a fair number of, of comments raising concerns about variances to the approved ENS plans. And I know from past experience that, that sometimes variances are necessary depending on construction conditions and so forth, uh, and they are permitted in the regulations, but um, obviously with a project like this, we need to be very careful about looking at variances, granting variances, and making sure they're completely necessary and appropriate and not going to cause environmental damage. Um, could you explain a little bit what sort of things you'd look at if there was a request for variance? Um, minimum standard 16 in the erosion and sediment control regulation says that open trenches shall not exceed a 500 foot length. There's also language in the regulation, as you um, suggested, or as you said, that allows DEQ to evaluate, um, well actually we can, we can evaluate variances from any of the minimum standards, but um, in this particular kind of construction, the issue is really about how much of an open trench um, can we authorize. We are looking at those open trench variances in the context of approving the plan sheets for erosion and sediment control. Um, and there's a balancing that goes on between um, what is the construction activity, um, how does it need to occur, what are um, the construction requirements of that project, what are safety considerations in terms of the folks that are working on that project, and then also um, what are the considerations for the potential um, for harm to occur. So it's a balancing of the number of those factors. Um, we certainly recognize um, and are, we will limit open trench length to what we determine is necessary for the construction operation, and we will limit it um, depending on the percent slope. So what we have talked about is for any slope that is 30% or greater, that variance is going to be less, certainly less, than what is in um, of the construction of down in the flatlands where the slope is zero. So we haven't finalized those determinations, but that's part of the conversation that we have been engaged in with the plan approval.
Any more questions that I can answer for you on erosion and the patrol and post construction stormwater? Just curious, but I know there's some counties that are opposed to these pipelines, but I know that there's other counties that are not opposed. So with those, um, do am I understanding that we have any MOUs or MOAs in place that yes, thank you. with these counties that would um, help to work with DEQ? Because they have those people in place that are certified, educated, stormwater um, folks. So the concept behind your erosion and sediment control regulation is that because of the nexus between ENS controls and building activities, that your program is actually delegated to localities if they want to adopt an appropriate erosion sediment control ordinance and administer that program. And I believe now, I think it was maybe two years ago, the last um, Virginia municipality that did not have erosion, an erosion and sediment control program has adopted it. So for the purposes of most projects, this conversation about ENS plans, review and approval of ENS plans would occur between the project owner and the locality. Linear utility projects, though, have been taken away from local ENS authority and given to the to DEQ. And I am completely conjecturing on this, but my guess is that the General Assembly um, made the decision that for those kinds of projects which traverse multiple localities, that it made sense to have one point, one point of plan review and approval, and that's DEQ. So um, one of my first conversations with localities um, about these two pipelines, I was in a meeting of the Roanoke River Basin Commission um, and the folks in the Roanoke area said, hey, is it true that we don't get to weigh in on ENS? And I went back um, and I dug around and I looked at what the statute says and the reg said, and I went back to them and said, yes, you don't have that authority. It has been taken for you, from you for these kinds of projects and given to DEQ. So um, I felt like if I were a locality, I might not be full with that. Um, but what we decided to do was we reached out to every locality that was affected either by the Mountain Valley Pipeline or the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and offered them the opportunity to sign a memorandum of agreement with DEQ. And really, um, it, was, it was trying to um, allow them to be partners to the extent that they could under state law. So the memorandum of agreement um, gives a locality two things. One is sort of an enhanced opportunity to review ENS plans. So um, again, we figured those folks knew the localities, they knew the topography, they knew their, their, their geography. So any locality that signed on to that plan, we said, you know, well, you, you've got an opportunity to review the ENS plans and we will sit down and talk with you and work through if there are any issues. The other element is that we have offered them an opportunity to partner with us in inspection and compliance activities. Because again, since DEQ is the erosion and sediment control authority for this project, localities don't have um, access to the project, they're not the regulator. So what we said is if you are interested in participating um, in this compliance activity with DEQ, sign this MOA, give us a point of contact, and we will give you notice um, whenever we're gonna go out on an inspection, we will invite you to come with us, and then you will be sort of, um, not necessarily a co-regulator, but being with DEQ, we can get you on the site, and you can conduct inspection activities. Um, I honestly don't know, I want to say six or seven localities along the Atlantic Coast Pipeline route have signed that memorandum of agreement. Um, I know a number of the counties um, through which Mountain Valley passed 
um, didn't want to sign it because they were afraid that somehow that would imply they supported the project, but they said, you know, we might want to talk to you um, once all the decisions are made. And we said, fine. I mean, we don't want localities cut out from this, and we are happy to take them on inspections. Um, I also wanted to mention, and thank you, it was a good segue there, um, when we communicated with ACP and said you have to submit project-specific plans and specifications, we also, there's, there's provision in the regulatory section that discusses annual standards and specs that says we can charge an annual standards and specifications holder um, for inspection activities. So um, we are absolutely um, staffing up with DEQ resources um, to make sure that we are out in the field when land disturbing activity does initiate. And we have a two-pronged approach. Um, we actually hosted a position, I want to say, last Friday for a pipeline inspection coordinator. And we are also working with the Department of General Services um, to see what kind of contracting um, options we have to actually hire third-party inspectors to be in the field, to be in the field as our eyes and ears, and then be working with the inspection coordinator. So, um, and thank you because I failed to mention that, that that was the third component of the letter um, that we sent. I apologize for the detail. <laughs> and I hope I can, I hope I can answer. I think if we saw the plans, some of this might be through us, but um, can you discuss inspection frequency then? Um, I can't speak to those details. I can certainly get staff up here if we can. We have the, the way the annual standards and specification program works um, is that the inspectors, the, the, the plans and spec holder has an obligation to perform inspections the same way a locality would if they were the erosion and sediment control authority. And I'm gonna to have to defer on the actual number of days to somebody who is more in the details. In addition to that, FERC requires any pipeline developer to have a host of environmental inspectors, which you're looking at all of those environmental requirements that are, that are included in the FERC certificate. So that's two layers. And then we will have inspectors out there looking at erosion and sediment control activities. Um, we haven't finalized a contract. Um, we are looking at what we think are the number of folks that need to be dedicated per spread, and I can't give you a number yet, um, but we are going to address it for active spreads. Um, we're going to have X number of inspectors, and um, so it's, there's really three levels of inspection, but in terms of what ENS requires for the annual standards and specification holder for that inspection frequency, I can turn the mic over. My name is Matt Stafford. I'm the uh, Stormwater Compliance Coordinator for DEQ. And uh, in regards to inspection frequencies, the general permit requirements, which were then adopted into the annual standards and specifications that were approved, um, are every four days for uh, inspections, or uh, every five days and every rainfall event. Uh, are we have the additional one there also? So uh, that's in areas that have uh, TMDLs. Outside of those areas in Virginia, the inspection frequency is once every five days or every 10 days and uh, within 48 hours of a rainfall event. As you heard yesterday, and as um, 
you can imagine we received a number of comments about um, the utilization of Nationwide Permit 12 or how DEQ um, is addressing um, permitting and protections related to the crossings of wetlands and streams. <coughs> so, as I mentioned yesterday, there is a federal program which is called Clean Water Act Section 404 and your state of Virginia Water Protection Regulation, which are really parallel regulatory programs, one at the federal level, one at the state level. There is a slight difference in terms of what the spatial jurisdiction is and that the Corps' jurisdiction is over the waters of the United States and DEQ's jurisdiction is over surface water, including wetlands in Virginia. And most of the time, those are gonna be the same water features. There may be instances where um, isolated non-tidal wetlands are regulated by the state program and they don't meet the definition of waters of the United States. But both of these programs apply to the same activities, which is dredging, filling, digging in, surface waters, or wetlands. So, um, if there is, we don't know the end of the story right now in terms of whether the Corps is going to authorize the wetland and stream crossings to be covered under Nationwide Permit 12. Both Virginia and the Corps utilize a number of general permits which are um, meant to minimize duplicative permitting actions. And I think the most important thing is that if the Corps determines an individual permit will be required for this project, for any of the crossings related to the project, DEQ has to provide 401 certification for that individual permit and that would require a state permitting action. So, the um, Corps Nationwide Permit authorizes the disturbance of streams and wetlands during construction of utility lines, and DEQ has provided its 401 water quality certification for Nationwide Permit 12. Um, one of the things that, that came up yesterday was um, some conversation about cumulative impacts. And Nationwide 12 says that each crossing is a single and complete project. So what the Corps is doing is looking at every crossing. They've actually been in the field for a couple of years because they have to do what's called a jurisdictional determination. So what they have to do is look at each of these crossings because the nationwide permit only authorizes an impact of a half an acre for each crossing. So the way it works is the Corps goes out, they determine the scope of the waters of the U.S., they determine the aerial impact, and if it's less than half an acre, then they evaluate whether it's appropriate to cover it under nationwide well. Um, as I said, we, DEQ, provided our 401 certification for Nationwide Permit 12 back in April of this year. Um, our certification was challenged. It was appealed. Um, we, we filed um, a motion to dismiss that appeal, and the appeal was withdrawn by the folks who challenged the 401 cert for Nationwide 12. So I think that story um, has an end. We have... Um, and in effect, in the force, 401 certification for Nationwide 12. So what does Nationwide 12 do? There's a lot of requirements, um, and not only are there requirements that are imposed by the Corps in its issuance, but in Virginia, the Norfolk District of the Corps has imposed a number of regional conditions, which also apply. Um, but the highlights of what Nationwide 12 requires is coordination, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on threatened and endangered species, and that is to make sure uh, that there's no take of a threatened and endangered species that is a result of this construction activity. 
Um, the permit also requires what's called Section 106 consultation, which is a review um, under the National Historic Preservation Act to make sure that no protected historic resources will be affected by the construction. Um, Nationwide 12 requires that the area of crossing must be returned to pre-construction conditions. Under the, um, the Norfolk District Regional Conditions, um, what they have provided are specific time of year restrictions related to construction activity in state waters, um, primarily focused on um, natural trout and not disturbing natural trout habitat. And Nationwide 12 requires mitigation for all permanent loss over a tenth of an acre of wetlands or 300 million feet of water. Hard, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you need me to go back over anything? Nationwide 12 also has a condition that requires appropriate soil erosion and sediment control measures during construction activity. So what that does is it puts back into DEQ's area of responsibility what are appropriate ENS measures um, as this construction activity occurs. So in fact, the ENS plans that I have spoken about, um, we also have plan sheets for every crossing. And it is what are the measures that are going to be utilized to make sure um, there's no erosion related to that. And really what that boils down to are what are called bridging measures. Um, so essentially um, you, you don't, well first of all, Virginia does not allow wet cuts. So you can't go into a stream and dig it up while there is water flowing. So then you have to figure out what bridging measures are appropriate um, for that particular crossing. Um, flume crossings, pump arounds, copper dams, those are the three major tools where you basically stop the flow of the stream, you dig the trench, you cover the trench, you restore the contour, and then you let the stream flow back. Um, and I have been told by my wetlands folks that those construction activities in most smaller streams happen in about a 24 or 48 hour period. Um, another way to um, avoid construction and flowing streams is to utilize horizontal directional drilling. And my understanding is that right now, ACP is proposing HDD crossings of about 14 streams. Um, and the factors that go into that are, um, you know, you know, it's really, it, in a lot of ways, it, it relates to um, the construct, the ability of that site to accommodate the equipment, and then the feasibility of actually turning off the stream flow. So those 14 crossings are really for um, a lot of the larger um, flat topography, the bigger stream crossings. How many, uh, how many of these streams are also under the uh, jurisdiction of the Marine Resources Commission? Uh, according to staff, 53. And to say that they're under the jurisdiction of the Marine Resources Commission means that um, the MRC is the owner of subaqueous lands in the Commonwealth of Virginia, so they have to grant a permit for construction activity to occur on those subaqueous bottoms which belong to the Commonwealth. Is the DMRC currently considering permit for permits? Yes. The, the, um, well, the tool that we use in Virginia is called the Joint Permit Application. Um, so once a ACP filed that application, they were actually applying to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they were applying to DEQ, and they were also applying to the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. And um, we worked through that collectively. I, I served on that commission for nine years. It's been some time ago. But, uh, when we permitted stream work, we uh, almost always had time of year restrictions based on using the recommendation of the uh, 
Department of Game and Fishing Fisheries, something like this and all that stuff. Occasionally, somebody could request a waiver from the time of year restrictions, but uh, not for months. There, there, there is a process for waiver from the time of year restrictions, but we, we, we didn't grant those waivers. Can this agency grant waivers from the time of year restrictions? Well, the regional conditions that the Norfolk District has, has imposed on Nationwide 12 are the Virginia Department of Game and Animal Fisheries recommendations for time of year restrictions. Um, Tom Walker, who is the regulatory chief for the Corps, is here. But my past experience is that we really try and keep everybody tied to those time of year restrictions because they're there to protect the resource. Right, well, there was some concern raised yesterday about when it comes to the time of year restrictions. And I just would like to know from somebody who's knowledgeable as to how that process would work. So, Tom? Um, ACP has indicated that the crossings do comply and can comply 